Okay, let's see if this works. Okay, are you seeing my screen? So zoomed out. <laughs> <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry that we're a little bit late getting rolling on this, but I haven't done well with technology today. So we're gonna talk about management of chronic pain, and it's really something that's common in our VMRC comp uh, consumer population. You'll see as we move on why that is. But pain in the population in general is a very common ailment. And in fact, uh, in pharmacies, it's one of the things that brings people in to buy uh, all kinds of non-prescription items. And we'll talk about all those today, plus prescription uh, items also. Let's see if we can make this work. There we go. I'm gonna go ahead and put this on full screen. Okay, so um, just a few quotes from a, a paper about pain from actually quite some time ago, but they are all still very applicable to today. And it, it is associated, it's an, un, it's an unpleasant sensory process or perceptual process uh, from that point of view. Um, and it, it really is a personal experience. And what I mean by that is the same stimulus that might cause a certain level of pain in one person may cause a different level of pain in another person because of various factors of how it's perceived or other things that are going on in that person's life at that time. So pain is a really very individual um, experience. Pain and then nociception, that's just a fancy word for the sensory things that go on when a painful stimulus, you know, for instance, you hit your finger, cut yourself or something like that. Really, those are, are, are two different phenomena. The pain is, um, is uh, not just inferred from how uh, strong the stimulus is in the neurons because it also has to do with how the person processes pain. I'm sure you've all seen someone who uh, it doesn't take much to cause them to experience a lot of pain and other people you might see something really um, serious happen to them and they're not complaining about a lot of pain. And so really it is kind of through people's life experiences that they learn this concept of pain. But one thing that is true is we work with uh, consumers or anybody for that matter, that when a person reports that they're experiencing pain, we need to respect that because it's difficult for us to um, interpret what's going on for that person. So we really do need to listen to them. Now, another thing about pain is that normally it serves what we would call an adaptive role. And what we mean by that is there's a reason that we have pain sensory uh, mechanisms in our body. So for instance, when you reach out and you touch something hot that causes pain, it causes you to draw away from it. And in that sense is what we would say it's adaptive because it's protecting you uh, to some extent. So that's generally what we associate with acute um, pain, acute events that has this adaptive function. On the other hand, chronic pain syndromes they're happening because there's something going on um, in the body at that point, but that uh, the occurrence of it is no longer adaptive. We know it's there and the long-term effects of chronic pain uh, can be very um, deleterious. Um, one thing that's uh, pointed out here that's really important for our consumers is that a verbal description alone is not adequate to tell us um, everything about a person's pain. You need to be able to look at some of the behaviors that are going on. And one thing that is certainly true, um, especially among our population of consumers, is the inability to communicate doesn't mean that pain is not going on. And um, so we, we can uh, experience pain and not be able to express it. And if you can't see that in your consumer, it doesn't mean that they're not having chronic pain. It just simply means they may not be able to express it. Chronic pain is a is a very, very common po problem in our population. About 30% of the population in the US suffers from some form of chronic pain. And that can be anything from arthritis to chronic headaches, uh, migraine headaches, um, various inflammatory states. Those kinds of things can lead to chronic pain syndromes. But in the um, developmentally disabled population, up to 70% of that group may have some form of, of chronic pain. And we'll talk about some of those factors in a moment, but there are a lot of risk factors in our consumers that would lead them to have these chronic pain syndromes. 
And it does seem to increase with age. I can tell you from my own personal experience that as you age, certain things happen to your body and uh, you're more likely to have chronic pain syndromes than you were when you were younger. So it's estimated that about 50 million Americans are disabled because of, of chronic pain uh, syndromes. So it's an important, uh, important problem in not only our consumer population, but also in the population at large. In terms of people who have developmental disabilities, there are a number of things that come along with having those disabilities that, that can come into play here. So for instance, um, they tend to have more medical conditions. Most of the consumers that I review their uh, medication profiles for have a number of medical conditions and many of them can be associated with chronic pain syndromes. Uh, risk of falls. So when they fall, they break something, hurt something, and that can lead to also chronic pain. There's also uh, research that shows that uh, in this population, they may be undertreated. Now you might think that um, there'd be more of a risk of overtreatment, but in fact, the risk of undertreatment is, is very real. And it has to do often with their inability to communicate with us about not only the occurrence of pain, but the kind of pain, where it hurts and how bad it hurts and those kinds of things. And another risk factor in our population is that they often have procedures that are required or interventions or things that can lead to pain syndromes. For example, um, sitting in a wheelchair without being able to move um, creates risk for problems um, in the buttocks and, and areas down there uh, from not being able to, to be mobile and circulatory issues that can happen. So there are a number of things that our consumers are exposed to that can also increase their risk of pain. So when you think about pain, um, I like to think of it in what's called a biopsychosocial model. And what we mean by that is that there are biological factors, there are psychological factors, and there are social factors that come into play with the final experience of what someone would call pain. So from a biological perspective, we're talking about things like tissue damage, injuries, infection, inflammation, cancer, damage to nerves, and those sorts of things. Those are all biological causes of pain. Uh, from a psychological standpoint, there are a number of things that can contribute to the experience of pain. So for instance, lack of sleep, uh, stress, anxiety, and depression can also exacerbate or affect the perception of pain and people's coping skills to be able to um, deal with the pain. All of these are psychological factors that can impact the pain experience. And from a social standpoint, other things, work, what you have to do at work, what you have to do in your family, those kinds of things, but also social networks, those things that contribute to mood and those kinds of things can also impact the pain experience. All of this goes to affect the health-related quality of life. In other words, how we experience life and how we feel about our lives. And so um, health-related uh, health quality of life involves issues like my ability to function, my ability to perform activities of daily living, to take care of myself, or do I need health help? It can also impact my mental health. As we'll talk about in a few moments, there's a connection between chronic pain syndromes and depression. Um, can, can, it can work kind of both ways. So the biopsychosocial uh, approach, I think, um, not only helps us to explain the pain experience, but it also gives us some areas where we might be able to work with a person to uh, positively impact their experience of pain. So I've already alluded to this, uh, that there are more than, there's more than one kind of pain. One kind of pain that we've already talked about, we, we call it nociceptive pain, and that's caused by stimuli that either threaten or actually cause actual tissue damage. So the easiest way to think about that is like touching something that's hot or having a, um, an inflammatory condition like rheumatoid arthritis or something along those lines. Um, even you know, down to having something like heartburn causes pain in the substernal area. So there are a number of factors that can lead to those kinds of biological kinds of pain. And then there's another type of biologic pain called neuropathic pain. What we mean here is it's, it's a disturbance in the nerves and it has to do with disrupting or disordering 
pain modulation, and, and it can involve either the central or peripheral nervous system. This kind of pain is also common. So for instance, with people who have long-term diabetes that's poorly controlled, they can develop what's called diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Neuropathy meaning um, damage to the nerves leading to nerve pain. And there are a number of ways that that can be experienced. People may often uh, call it a tingling or a burning. They may also talk about shooting pains or lancinating pains. They may feel like they're having uh, needles and pins or tingling. Um, so for instance, if you have um, an issue in the spinal cord, like you have a bulging disc or something, it impinges on a, one of those nerves, then that down that nerve track, then you can experience these kinds of pain. And it, it can be anything from mild tingling all the way up to uh, feeling like you're getting electric shocks. And so this kind of pain can, can uh, be um, very difficult to, to manage, in fact. And we'll talk about some ways that we do that. So as I said, there are a lot of things that can cause pain. Injury, obviously, is one form, but chronic illnesses. So um, among our consumers, we do have a lot of chronic illness, and that includes things like arthritis, osteoporosis, diabetes. Uh, many of them have gastrointestinal intestinal problems. They may have syndromes that lead to neuropathic pain. They have headache. Um, there can also be pain that's a result simply from their immobility or how they're positioned. So if they, if they're, um, if they don't have much uh, mobility on their own and they're left into uh, one position for a long period of time, that can also lead to uh, pain. Muscle spasticity and cramping is another one. So sometimes our, our patients who have multiple, um, sorry, cerebral palsy, who have uh, spasticity along with cerebral palsy can also have pain. Infections, obviously, I think we all know that when we have infections, um, that can cause pain, particularly those that involve swelling and redness and inflammation that, you know, in the body. Dental problems, um, that's something that needs to be watched out for because it can often be overlooked. But patients can develop cavities and uh, they can develop other kinds of problems in the mouth. Um, abscesses, inflammation, those kinds of things uh, can all lead to pain. So there's a number of things that, that need to be considered when you're thinking about what causes pain. So I wanted to show you um, just a little bit about the, uh, the, the uh, pain, uh, how it's uh, directed up to the brain that we per perceive it. So on this left diagram here, you'll see over on the left corner, this thing called noxious, noxious, noxious stimulus. And what that is, is something that, that uh, causes the firing of this um, sensory uh, nerve out in that area. So again, thinking of things like um, hitting your finger with a hammer or something along those lines, it stimulates that, that uh, uh, nociceptive receptor, and that sends a signal along that nerve, and it ends up over in the spinal cord in what's called the dorsal horn. If you look over on the um, right um, diagram here, you'll see that that signal goes over into the spinal cord, and then you'll see a green nerve that goes up towards the brain, and it goes through various areas of the brain, eventually um, getting out to the cortex where you have the sensory experience of the pain. Um, just a couple things about this is that you can see that any problem along this area, uh, this whole line from uh, the receptor out here to the spinal cord and then on up to the brain, any problem along the nervous system in that area could um, alter the experience of pain. Um, could cause pain, or there's some things we can do, for instance, pharmacologically that affect the transmission of that signal on up into the brain. There's some medications that we can give that actually reduce the transmission of that signal once it gets to the spinal cord on up to the brain. So um, that's, that's a little bit about where it, it goes. From a in terms of neuropathic pain, there are a number of, of syndromes that we can have that um, can cause nerve, what we call nerve pain. So for instance, post herpetic neuralgia, if you've ever had uh, shingles, for instance, or some other form of, of infection, viral infection like that, you can be left with um, nerve damage and it can lead, can lead to what we call post herpetic neuralgia. Carpal tunnel syndrome, which is fairly common in, in our um, society, and it has to do with pain in the wrist. The carpal tunnel area is where a nerve um, goes through. 
and um, chronic things like I know carpenters often who swing a lot of hammers and such can get carpal tunnel, but so can people who sit at computers all day long with their wrists in a, a bad position can get carpal tunnel. You can have traumatic issues uh, that happen to the body that smash nerves and things and leave, leave you with pain. People who have a poorly controlled diabetes are at high risk for developing what we call diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And that can be um, can cause pain, experiences of, of pain. Uh, phantom limb pain occurs when you have, for instance, an amputation. For whatever reason, you've amputated maybe the lower part of the leg. And the phantom pain is uh, the person experiences pain and it seems like it's down in that extremity that was actually amputated. That can be very difficult to um, treat. And then cancer, if it, if it gets over and starts involving nerves, can also cause neuropathic pain. So there are a number of mechanisms here that can lead to this. And this diagram on the left, on the right, shows you that it starts with nerve damage and, and injury to the nerve. And it can be either peripheral nerves or issues in the um, spinal cord. And all of these lead to experiencing what we call neuropathic pain. And you can see um, on this diagram here, they show some places where some of the medications that we might be able to use uh, to help with neuropathic pain, uh, where they would fit into this. So for instance, uh, sodium channel blockers, that would include some of the um, anticonvulsant drugs that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Over on the right side, you'll see GABA agonist written there, and that's where we um, use the drug, uh, drugs, one called um, gabapentin, and another one called uh, pregabalin that can affect those pain mechanisms there. And so that's sort of a rationale for using those kinds of, what we don't normally consider these as analgesic medications, but when it comes to nerve pain, they can actually produce some relief of the pain. So as I already said, pain is a really individual um, experience. And so when you're looking at consumers and you're trying to help them with their pain, you have to think of them as an individual people respond in different ways. So we have to look at all those different factors that we've talked about to see what might be contributing to the pain that the consumer is having. And it can direct us not only in identifying some of the causes, but it can also direct us in terms of some of the treatment modalities that we might use. And one of the things we wanna for sure um, encourage is a caring approach to people who have these pain syndromes because pain itself causes a lot of stress for us when we have it. And if you have chronic pain, this uh, chronically uh, keeps you stressed and it can affect your mood, it can affect your behaviors, it can affect your interactions with other people. Um, it's just not fun to be around somebody who's in a lot of pain and it's not fun to be that person. On the right here, you'll see sort of an approach to um, looking at the whole syndrome of pain, provocative what's causing it, palliative, what can we do about it? Quality, quantity, R for region, where does it hurt? Radiation, where does it go? Does it, does it radiate away? So for instance, sometimes back pain, you can have pain in your back, but it can affect the nerve that goes down, for instance, into the lower legs. So you can have pain in your back and then it goes down that nerve, for instance, like with sciatica. Um, severity, obviously, we'll, we'll talk in a moment about how to rate the severity of pain to get some idea of where the person is and what we need to do. Timing, when does it occur? Um, some things um, occur only at certain times of the day. So, for instance, some musculoskeletal issues might not be uh, perceived as, as really significant during the day, but when you go to bed at night, uh, for instance, if you've got a um, sore shoulder for some reason. Maybe during the day it doesn't hurt so much, but when you go to bed and you lay on it, that's when it hurts. And so those are kind of important factors for us to know. T for treatment, obviously we're gonna talk about how to do that, and U for understanding responses to the person. So there are a number of, of things uh, that we can look at with consumers that can help us to kind of get an idea of where they are on the severity level with their pain. So I already mentioned that uh, we use rating scales and such, particularly in, in the hospital. If you go in the hospital, my hospital anyway, and you come to the nursing station, you say I have pain, they'll ask you, well, how severe is it on a scale of one to 10? Okay, so that may not always be work for some of our consumers to have 
communicative um, issues where they can't really tell us how it hurts on a scale of one to 10 or for whatever reason. But I put this up here because you can begin to kind of look at someone and get some idea of what kind of pain they're in. So for instance, looking at the face, if you look at somebody who's in chronic pain, often you can see in their face things like grimacing or frowning, or maybe their behavior is that they're withdrawn, they're not interested in activities right now, they're just not engaging anymore. Um, up to a, a higher level would be constant frowning, clenching of the jaw, quivering and such. That's pretty obvious that that's very significant pain. If you look at the legs, they're normal, they're relaxed, there's usually not a lot of pain. If they're uneasy or restless, or if it gets even worse and it's you know kicking or drawing up their legs, that would indicate more severe pain activity. What are they doing? Are they engaging? Are they able to lay quietly in normal positions? Or are they squirming? Um, and it's very uh, common to see people who are really hurting to be you know, fidgeting and squirming, very difficult to stand still, all the way up to having an arched back, uh, rigid jerking. How about crying? Um, if they're not crying, uh, that doesn't mean they don't have any pain, but if they start to have um, groans and moaning and those kinds of things, all the way up to then steadily crying or sobbing, then obviously that's a, a more severe kind of pain. And then lastly, consolability. You know, are you able to um, console the patient to relax the person? Or, um, you know, does that work for a few moments and then they go back to having pain all the way up to inconsolable stuff? So that's just one way to look at, at what's going on with your consumer where you don't even really, uh, you're not relying on them communicating to you. You can just see it in the way they're behaving, the kind of pain that they have. Now, another way to look at it is on, and there's a variety of these scales. Most of them are 10 point scales. That's what we use in our hospital is a 10 point scale. And the most common way we do it is we simply ask the patient on a scale of one to 10, one being no pain, all the way up to 10 being the worst pain you can imagine. Where are you on that scale? Now, a couple of things about that. Um, again, how people rate their pain uh, on this scale compared to another person could be different. So in other words, the same pain that I experience, and I say is an eight, another person might experience the very same thing and say a six. So that just you know um, tells you again that it's a very individual experience. So you really can't compare me with an eight to another person with a six. What you can do for me is if I say it's an eight, and then you give me some form of treatment. Maybe it's a couple of Tylenol or a couple of Advil or something like that. And then an hour or so later, you come back and you ask me, well, what is it now? Okay, now you're gonna compare what I say now versus what I said when you uh, gave me the treatment. And if I say, well, now it's a four, then obviously in my perception, I've improved. So again, it's not really very easy to use a 10 point scale to compare one person to another but it is something that tells us in this person, how severe are they perceiving the pain? And then if we do something about it, are they experiencing relief? Now, if you see these faces down here, we can even use these with children because it would be hard for children to conceive of what we mean by a scale of one to 10. Um, but we, these uh, smiley faces or frowning faces have been used with children and, and can actually help us. They can be pretty effective ways of gauging the kind of pain that they have. So I have a story I can tell you that shows you how this uh, might vary from person to person. I was talking with someone recently and um, another person was having a migraine headache and this person was basically laying um, on the floor, clearly hurting. And um, so the, the, the person asked her, well, how severe is the pain? And she called it an eight. And in his view, how could it possibly be an eight? You are laying on the floor, you were hurting. How could it possibly be an eight? Because in my world, that would be a 10, okay? But see the difference in how a person might perceive it. So he, he asked her, well, you know, how, what would make it a nine? 
And she's had some remark about, well, I'd be throwing up or something like that. So it's all I'm saying here is that comparing between people with these scales is a very difficult thing, but using them within a person just for one person can be very useful. So why does pain sometimes get worse? Uh, you know, we don't treat it. Well, obviously the underlying cause could be getting worse. So for instance, something could start out with mild inflammation and then as it progresses, now you have more severe inflammation, therefore you have more pain. So whatever the pathology is, could be getting worse. The infection could be getting worse. The inflammatory condition could be getting worse or whatever. Um, but then also sometimes there's an emotional component. And when we're under stress or we're depressed, our perception of pain can differ. In fact, uh, many of the people, I work in a psychiatric unit, and many of the people in our unit, when they experience pain, it seems like it's, um, it's more painful than I would have expected. And it could be that that um, mood or affective component is affecting their perception of the pain. So that's what we mean by psychiatric and emotional factors, but also stress. Clearly stress can impact our perception of pain. Moving on a little bit towards treatment, for a long, long, long time, the World Health Organization has had what they call the analgesic ladder. It's undergone some changes over the years, but the concept has remained the same. Um, unless you have you know, really severe pain, then we would normally start in this stepwise process. Step one for mild pain would be a non-opioid. And obviously we're gonna talk some more about opioids in a few moments, but in our culture today, our society today, where there has been an opioid uh, epidemic of people overusing things like Marco and Vicodin, um, heroin, morphine, those kinds of things uh, has led to a lot of problems for society. So for mild pain, we don't use those. We typically start with a what we call non-opioid analgesic. And what we mean by that is something like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or NSAID. Um, a, an example of that is ibuprofen. You can also, you can get that over the counter. You can get prescription strengths. Uh, naproxen, you can also get that over the counter. You can get that in prescription strengths. Acetaminophen or aspirin. Those are all called non-opioid um, analgesics. Then when we get uh, a little higher up on that ladder, you'll see in step two where you've got moderate pain. And again, there's going to be a diagnostic process that goes along with this, um, especially if we're talking about acute pain versus chronic pain. So for instance, let's say you just got out of the hospital, you've had some serious surgery for whatever reason, and you have a real reason to have uh, moderate to severe pain. They're probably not going to discharge you just on Tylenol. They're probably going to give you um, a weak, uh, what we call a weak opioid agent, if not possibly even a stronger one, depending on what the pathology is. Um, but we clearly are much less likely today to use these opioid analgesics uh, willy-nilly like we did in decades past. Uh, where we ended up then having too many of those things out in the market, people abusing them and those kinds of things. So normally in step two, they were talking about a weak opioid. And notice I've put, or they've put in this uh, middle one, plus or minus a non-opioid. Um, and what they mean by that, so for instance, when you talk about Norco and Vicodin, those are actually combinations of acetaminophen plus hydrocodone. Uh, and so you're combining a non-opioid with an opioid and you might get additive benefit of having those two drugs together. Adjuvants, um, if you look down below on this, an adjuvant is something that's not typically an analgesic on its own, um, but when you add it for um, certain kinds of pain, it may actually um, improve the pain. And so we're talking there about antidepressants, anticonvulsants. Um, if you've got gastrointestinal pain, maybe we give you um, an antispasmodic. Um, or muscle relaxants for muscle issues. So those are what we call adjuvants. Those are add-on to the core treatment, the core analgesic treatment. We would add these agents on. And then when you get all the way up to more severe pain, then you're talking about more uh, uh, stronger opioid drugs. And we're talking there about morphine, possibly fentanyl, uh, oxycodone, et cetera. But I want to point out again that while this is still 
I think conceptually true. Uh, what we're finding now is prescribers are much more cautious uh, when giving out prescriptions for um, opioid uh, medications. They give uh, fewer out with the prescription. Um, I know a lot of times when, when people are having surgery that doesn't cause a lot of severe pain, they're often sending patients out on um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, possibly with a small number of um, something like a Norco or a Vicodin, but, but in small numbers, whereas they used to give you, you know, I know once I had surgery and they sent me out with a whole bunch of Norco, that probably wouldn't happen today because of what's happened in our society with opioid, with the abuse of prescription medications. Now, I already mentioned that there can be a connection also between pain and depression. And sometimes, to be honest with you, it's not true, not, not easy to tell which came first, where there was a depression and then something happened and they, they experienced pain that, that maybe that level of stimulus didn't cause pain before, or they have chronic pain and it affects how they function, it affects their mood, and then they end up depressed. So there's this, this classic connection that's gone on uh, we've known about for, for a long, long time. So if the pain isn't controlled and they're in chronic pain, that can be a, a factor that increases the risk of having a depressive episode. And as I said, if, if a person's already depressed, then their perception or the experience of pain can also be affected uh, like that. And these things can reinforce each other so we do want to break that cycle, whether we treat, you know, the depression and or the, the pain to, to break that cycle. So let's then move on really into pain management. What do we do about it? Well, step one is to consider non-pharmacologic approaches. And that can be, um, you know, it could be effective for all patients or some of these things you wouldn't use in certain patients. So for instance, exercise. Um, for conditions like arthritis, um, some of those kinds of uh, conditions. Uh, exercise as tolerated can help improve the um, pain experience. We often see people who have chronic uh, musculoskeletal issues going to physical therapy or possibly occupational therapy. And uh, they generally uh, prescribe home exercise for you, very stretching kinds of, of exercises and things like that to improve core strength or, or doing stretching so that you don't have um, as many um, stiff muscles, stiff joints. You may see also people going to chiropractors who uh, also use a ver uh, various physical modalities of not only uh, the manipulative things that they do, but they also use um, heat therapy. They use electrical stimulation therapy. There are a number of things that chiropractors do to um, impact pain. And remember, pain can, be, can have a number of, of places where we can intervene with it to improve it. Other physical modalities are heating pads, ice packs. One of the things you wanna find out about um, the particular kind of pain you have, musculoskeletal pain, is when should I use a cold pack versus a, um, a heating pad or a hot pack of some sort? Often uh, for those in, in acute injuries, they will recommend first ice packs and you have to be careful with that. You don't leave those on for all that long. You put them on just for a few minutes and then you take them away and you do that several times a day. And then after the initial couple of days, they may change you to heat therapy. Um, initially, uh, or so they tell me, I'm not a physical therapist, but they tell me that with the initial injury, you really would rather use more cold therapy than you would hot because of the inflammation that's going on. Another thing uh, that can be used, obviously, would be things like transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulators. We call those TENS unit, T-E-N-S. Um, what those do is, well, let me explain it. When you have a pain receptor, or let's say that, um, let's say I hit my finger with a hammer, okay? I've obviously stimulated pain receptors. That pain signal is going to go up my arm. It's going to go into my spine. It's going to go up to my brain. At the level of the spinal cord, there's obviously other nerves they're inputting at that same place that this nerve is, right? So you got a number of nerves coming into this place and then it gets projected up to the brain. If you stimulate some of these other nerves that are not involved in having hit my finger, then it limits the number of the pain impulses that actually get shot up to the brain. So for instance, if I do hit my finger with a hammer, 
what is my first response? It's usually to shake my hand, right? And what that does is it causes a number, number of sensory impulses to impact in the same place. And only a certain number can actually get through and go up to the brain. So with, with a TENS unit, what you're doing is you put a small thing on there and it puts a small electrical current. It's not a shock, it's just a small electrical current. And that um, can help provide some signals to block down how many are actually going to get up to the brain. And massage therapy can help. You can see now on the market, a lot of these kind of guns that have this impulse uh, massage gun thing that you can buy that a lot of people are using now. Um, another thing to think about is um, sleep and trying to improve sleep because if you're if you're sleep deprived, you're probably going to have a, a heightened experience of pain. Now, if you have chronic pain syndromes, and sometimes we can't fix what's wrong, and so then you're at risk for going ahead and having chronic pain. That's where we can do um, some psychological kinds of things, not only um, uh, patient education but we can also do stress management. We can do cognitive behavior therapy. We can do things to help you adapt to life as it is now. And that can actually positively impact the uh, pain experience. Another thing to think about is, is um, with lifestyle changes is diet and, um, and weight management, because for some kinds of pain, musculoskeletal pains being overworked, overweight, can actually um, increase or worsen the pain. And then finally, there's some other stuff that uh, does seem to work, acupressure, acupuncture. Acupuncture is the one that, where they put the little needles in to certain points. Typically, this is provided by, by uh, traditional Chinese uh, medical doctors who do this. And there are a number of these um, uh, alternative therapies that many patients can actually work. I've had some friends who, who actually did very well, for instance, on acupuncture. Now, if, if non-pharmacological therapy isn't enough, then that's where we start thinking about giving people medications. So if it's nociceptive pain or you know, tissue damage, injury kinds of pain, we generally start, like I said, with the NSAIDs. Um, and those would especially be preferred if there's inflammation because Tylenol or acetaminophen uh, does not reduce inflammation. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen and naproxen and some others, celecoxib, they can reduce inflammation. Uh, generally, these are well-tolerated. Uh, the common problems that you need to be aware of with those NSAIDs is gastrointestinal upset. So you want to always take these drugs with food. They can actually affect the mucosal barrier on the inside of your GI tract and make it more susceptible to damage from acid. So we recommend that you take those with meals. Um, another thing that people need to think about with these drugs is they can cause damage to the kidneys, particularly if you use them in long, for long periods of time. So we try to limit the use of the insects to only as long as we really need to have those. Um, another drug I've already mentioned is acetaminophen, which the brand name we all know is Tylenol. Um, and uh, it just does not possess anti-inflammatory properties, but it is an effective analgesic. On the downside with acetaminophen is if you overuse it or use it in higher doses for long periods of time, it can damage the liver. So um, again, we want to use it in a time-limited way and not every day, um, all the time. There's also topical therapy out there now um, that can be... Um, um, very effective for some patients. So um, these products generally contain things that what we call counter irritants. And again, um, they cause sensations when you put it on the scan that um, affects those nerve fibers and sends more signals over to the spine. And it takes advantage of this thing that we call the gate theory, which reduces pain sensation or pain signals getting up to the brain. And so topically, we use a lot of things with methyl, uh, our methyl salicylate, menthol, capsation, which is um, uh, derived from pepper plants. It causes mild uh, irritation in, of the skin. It also affects the pain receptors. Lidocaine, in my hospital, we use a lot of lidocaine patches that um, they're either 4% or 5%, and they can, can also be helpful. Also, you now, um, in terms of non-prescription uh, non items, you can see that 
some of these NSAID gels like diclofenac are now available over the counter. And what that does is it puts the NSAID right on the site uh, where the pain is, or the inflammation is occurring. And for some people, those can actually be um, quite helpful. Now, last in this area are combination products. And here you can see uh, most often a combination of acetaminophen, aspirin, and, or an NSAID, and caffeine. And you might ask, well, okay, so why is the caffeine in there? Caffeine seems to augment the pain relieving effect of acetaminophen and um, aspirin. And it's been shown, for instance, in studies of pain where they uh, study patients who've had wisdom teeth removed, you know, what kind of pain relief did you get from this acetaminophen versus acetaminophen aspirin plus co uh, caffeine. One of the products that you'll see um, on the market, besides generic versions of this, is Excedrin Migraine. Excedrin Migraine has a combination of acetaminophen, aspirin, and caffeine. And for many patients with migraines, that's an effective combination. Now, for neuropathic pain, um, some of the regular analgesics that we use, like NSAIDs and even opiates, um, do not do a lot to, rel to relieve neuropathic pain. And so we use other medications like the antidepressants. And we're talking here primarily the older, what we call tricyclic antidepressants. And those would be things like amitriptyline. Um, but we also use some of the newer ones, the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake blockers, for instance, uh, desvinlafaxine or Cymbalta, uh, brand name of one of these products, uh, can be effective for um, neuropathic pain. But we also found that some of the, what we would classically call anti-convulsants or anti-seizure drugs also seem to relieve some of these uh, neuropathic pain syndromes, gabapentin, pregabalin, carbamazepine, and oxcarbazepine. The classic one, the first one up there is carbamazepine for years and years and years. We've used carbamazepine for, for things like trigeminal nerve pain, what's called trigeminal neuralgia up in this area, um, diabetic peripheral neuropathy. So very often now, when you have these neuropathic pain syndromes, the most common medications I see used in my practice are these antidepressants like amitriptyline is a good example, or the anticonvulsants, particularly right now, uh, carbamazepine and gabapentin. And gabapentin is probably the most common one that I'm seeing used these days. So what if your first line medications don't work? Well, obviously, no brainer, we're gonna try changing to a different drug. And what I would recommend at that point is changing to a different pharmacologic class, uh, something that uses a different mechanism of action. Another option is if you get some relief from the first step, if this is a problem that's amenable to a topical agent. So for instance, if you have joint pain, um, then I think obviously one of the topical creams, whether it's uh, one of the counter irritants like methyl salicylate or menthol or one of the new NSAID um, gels that has, for instance, diclofenac in it, you could add that or you could change to it or you could add it to the oral therapy um, that you're using. Another option is to use uh, different interventions, non-pharmacologic interventions, some of the alternative or complementary uh, procedures or physical um, procedures like physical therapy or chiropractic, something along those lines. And then you can start thinking about if the lower level non-opioid analgesics haven't worked, then maybe I need to think about um, an opioid. And here, you know, there are a lot of considerations. How long is it going to be used for? What are the risks for um, abuse? Uh, those kinds of things have to come into play whenever you start thinking about using an opioid. So you could start at what we would call a more mild form, tramadol, codeine, something like that. And then eventually, if it's severe pain or you know there's clear pathology involved here and you're seeing a pain specialist, you can think about the stronger forms, oxycodone and some of those. But again, I wanna emphasize that we're very, very careful today in using these kinds of medications because they can have, and they clearly have an, addif an addictive risk to their use. And they, so they can be abused and they can lead to addiction and all kinds of problems. So we're very, very careful. Now, does that apply uh, for some of our patients, our consumers uh, that are in the system? 
Uh, they would be very unlikely to abuse these if, you know, for instance, they're confined to a living place or something like that. All that would have to be considered. Um, but we do have consumers who are taking these uh, opiate uh, medications and they're in places where we don't necessarily have to worry that they're uh, abusing them or or out on the street. But I have also seen consumers who are responsible for their own medications that we do want to be very careful using opioids, opioids in those patients. So it's something that the prescriber would have to consider very carefully. So again, from a non-prescriptive, a non-prescription standpoint, and this will apply to you and me as much as it would to consumers. What do we have available to us? We can use obviously acetaminophen, aspirin, or insets. Now, aspirin, I usually don't recommend aspirin for pain relief. I guess if you were going to take it once because you had a headache and you take 650 milligrams of aspirin, I'm probably not too worried about it. But if you're going to use it very, very long, then I do have a concern about aspirin because of, of all these medications. It's the one that's most clearly linked to damage in the gastrointestinal tract. It will eventually cause bleeding in the GI tract. So I would be very careful about recommending aspirin um, in, in analgesic doses for long periods of time. Now that doesn't necessarily uh, you know, apply to the low dose aspirin that we use, for instance, for cardioprotective effects for preventing MIs. That, those are generally in the range of 81 milligrams, maybe to um, 162 or maybe one full 325 aspirin per day, um, generally in lower doses. Um, mostly what I dispense for the cardiac protection or stroke protection is usually the 81 milligram tablet. And that uh, does increase risk of GI bleeds, but not as much as if you were taking 650, you know, four times a day uh, for whatever reason. So I'm not a big fan of aspirin for, for most of the pain things. When I see patients, I usually recommend either acetaminophen or one of the, the NSAIDs. Again, with the caution uh, that I already mentioned. One thing to remember though, is just because you can buy them without a prescription doesn't mean that they're appropriate for everyone, nor does it mean uh, that they can't have some serious side effects. There have been people, for instance, who've taken non-prescription ibuprofen and had significant kidney damage. I, have a, I know a guy who's a nephrologist, kidney doctor, and uh, he's seen a number of cases of people who've um, taken these NSAIDs uh, for prolonged periods and end up with um, kidney problems. The topical medications obviously don't have as much risk of systemic problems because you're not taking them orally. You're applying them right to the place where they, they uh, work. The things that you have to be careful about, obviously, is too much irritation. If you put too much on or you're particularly sensitive to that um, component, whether it's capsaicin or, or a menthol or methyl salicylate or something along those lines. Um, otherwise, they're generally pretty well <coughs> tolerated. And then lastly, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulators are now available. You can actually buy those yourself. They're battery operated and they're fairly small. And you put a little patch or electrode on the site that hurts. And then you can take the little uh, battery operated thing and put it in your pocket where it will turn on. And like I said, it is not, it's not causing a shock. You won't feel it as a shock, but you might feel a little tingling sensation with that. And for many uh, people, that actually can be an, an effective non-pharmacologic modality. So again, this is the list of, of um, non-opioid analgesics that I've already talked about. The last one on that list I did want to point out, we have what we call COX-2 inhibitors. And COX-2 COX is an uh, enzyme in the pathway of, of these inflammatory uh, mediators. And the most common one now that we use is called celecoxib. The brand name is Celebrex. And uh, the advantage of this is it causes less um, GI irritation. And so um, many patients are, are on that rather than the traditional NSAIDs. Now, again, about opioids, the debate has to do with risk versus benefit. Now, for many, many types of pain, clearly, these are effective analgesics. I mean, um, the first time I was given uh, one of these drugs, I had really significant pain, and I had never had one of those drugs. And I will tell you that after I got my injection, um, I, I definitely felt better. Same thing after surgery. I had surgery, and um, postoperatively for 24 hours, I had a, a morphine drip. Clearly, it, it improved my pain. It made me feel better. 
But on the downside, um, there are a number of side effects that we can that we have to deal with if you take opiates. But also the the bigger picture too with long term use has to do with addiction and um, dependence, and these clearly lead to that. And so in our society over the last few decades, there has been an increasing problem with abuse of prescription medications, things like Vicodin and Norco. And then you have the whole um, illicit market out there that's uh, you know bringing in heroin and various things like this. And now you've got all of these uh, different forms of fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl is a, is a very good drug for us in the hospital for certain kinds of procedures. Um, and also relieving pain, we know how to use it, and we get it. We know it the we know the, the quality of the product that we're getting. But then there are a lot of these synthetic things that are out there that are illicitly being made available, and it's extremely potent. Uh, fentanyl is is given in terms of micrograms, not milligrams and not grams, but micrograms. It's extremely potent, and some of these things are coming in illicitly that are these fentanyl analogs are even more potent to the point where if you were just to expose your skin with some of these things, the absorption could be such that you could be in real trouble. So while fentanyl itself is a, is a very good drug for us in the hospital for certain procedures and uh, things like that, very dangerous on the street because of its potency. And um, I continually hear of people who have overdosed and died because they bought something on the street that was a tablet and they thought it was a Norco or something. It was, it was um, adulterated with one of these illicit fentanyl compounds and they die because it, they have no idea what, what level is in there, what the potency is. So um, it, it's a big deal. Now with the um, problem, particularly with hydrocodone, which is in Norco and Vicodin, the DEA changed it to what's called a Schedule II um, narcotic. And what that means is the prescribing process is different. They have to take certain precautions when they prescribe it, take a certain number of refills, et cetera. There are a lot of restrictions on it. And the idea was to make it less available. But we still do see a high uh, rate of prescription drug abuse out there. Um, the Fed is trying to um, minimize that. They're putting restrictions on manufacturers about how many they can produce. Um, they've gone after them uh, legally. Uh, certain manufacturers have, ha have had um, to deal with um, charges against them for overproduction and such like that. And then we also have to think about the what is addiction and um, versus um, dependence. Now, if you take a narcotic for a bona fide reason, let's say you do have cancer and you have a very real reason for having pain and you have a very real reason for taking the um, opioid uh, medication. So for instance, let's say you're taking morphine. Well, with time to relieve the pain, it's gonna take more morphine because you develop tolerance to the effects of it. But you will also become physically dependent so that if we were to stop you cold turkey, you would withdraw from it and have problems. But that's something we would expect because we're treating a bona fide condition. Now, addiction is more of a behavioral, at least in my mind, it's more of a behavioral thing. And it says that you're using this and using it in higher doses in spite of uh, negative consequences of it um, in your life and you're seeking it and those kinds of things. And that's what's happened with this prescription um, drug abuse that we're trying to deal with in so many areas of the country. So in terms of what we do today is obviously we're just much more cautious about using opioids and we're not handing out prescriptions like um, they would say 15 years ago. It was not hard to get a prescription for narco, uh, number 30, refill times three or something like that. You just don't see that that much anymore because we're having to be so much more careful. There are I, the way I look at these things in terms of timing is they're short acting and they're long acting. Uh, short acting, you know, oxycodone with acetaminophen is the brand name is called Percocet. Oxycodone with aspirin, oxy with ibuprofen, hydrocodone with acetaminophen, that's Norco and Vicodin. Um, and then there's a combination of hydrocodone with ibuprofen. And these are all effective analgesics, but they don't last that long. So you have to take them uh, more than once a day. 
you know, often every six hours or eight hours. But then there are the long acting ones. And so you have sustained relief, uh, release formulations of morphine, oxycodone, um, oxy is oxycontin, which you've probably heard that name out there. There's a, a movie showing on one of the streaming uh, things now about that epidemic that was started with um, a lot of uh, promotion of, of, um, of oxycontin. And um, it was supposed to have very low abuse potential because of its long acting nature and stuff like that. Then it turned out to actually that wasn't the case. It was very abusable. We have fentanyl in transdermal systems. So if we use fentanyl, if somebody has a chronic pain syndrome, let's say it is cancer or something, we can use these fentanyl transdermal patches and you put them on the um, last a, a fairly long time. Methadone is a long acting uh, opiate. It has a long half-life in the body and you see some patients on that. So these all are longer acting opioids. And the only reason I mention that is if you do have a bona fide syndrome, let's say you do have cancer and it's a, pain, it's a painful cancer, um, it may make sense to put a person on one of these long acting forms and you control it. You get them to a dose that controls it and then you start watching them for breakthrough pain. And so you give them maybe a long acting one to get them through the day, but then you get a rescue medication. Maybe it's a they get put on a morphine extended release and then maybe they have a prescription for Norco to take if they have a breakthrough pain. If you start seeing them use more of the Norco, then you can up the dose on the long acting form to get them through the day so they don't have to use this many, these many uh, rescue medications. So there's a real role for these drugs in appropriate patients and under appropriate monitoring conditions. But there are some things that you have to watch out for with opioids. One is they can depress your uh, respirations. And that just means slowing down the number of times you breathe per minute. And if you overdose on these, you may stop breathing. Okay, it's just that simple. Another thing that we always have to think about if we're treating patients with opioids for long periods of time, well, even short periods of time, is you can get constipated. And opiate-induced constipation is a very real problem and it has to be addressed. And we do have medications that we can give people to um, help ameliorate the constipation. Uh, they can cause dizziness, they obviously cause sedation and sleepiness. And then there's drug interactions. So for instance, um, you give these drugs with other drugs that cause sleepiness and it just makes the sleepiness worse. Um, but then also combining them with drugs like the drug class benzodiazepines, examples are Ativan or Valium. It really increases that risk of um, respiratory uh, depression and further problems. So we try to not combine those. Um, and then of course you can have additive effects with alcohol. If you're taking these drugs, uh, you should probably avoid alcohol, but certainly if you're gonna drive, don't combine these with alcohol because these drugs themselves are a risk for you driving because they do make you sleepy. So you have to think very carefully um, about um, and you'll see that label on your prescription bottle about being careful about driving, being careful um, operating machinery, those kinds of things, because they clearly cause sedation, then they can cause impaired driving. So you have to consider that very carefully with these drugs. Now, I already mentioned addiction, but let me just kind of briefly tell you what, what it really looks like. Um, the four Cs, compulsive use and preoccupation with using and with obtaining the narcotic and an inability to control the use. In other words, it, I go out of control. I can't help it, I can't stop. And then craving, when I don't get it, I crave it. And it's often that craving then that drives the behaviors to um, obtain it and use it again. The craving can be one of the, the, the more difficult aspects to um, manage, even more so than the, than the withdrawal, because if you stop using, um, the narcotics, you are going to physically withdraw. You're going to feel things. Um, but that lasts a, just a short period of time. You may feel like you're going to die, but you're, you're not. But then when you get past that and you move out, it becomes the craving that really then drives um, subsequent use. And then uh, continued use despite adverse effects on your life. You, you know it's not good. You know it's harming you but you really, really can't control it. So this is really a little bit different than what we call physical dependence or have called physical dependence in the past. So once again, long-term use of opioids has to be 
you know, determined very carefully if it's appropriate and then monitored very carefully as it goes on. Let's talk about the antidepressants. Um, obviously, um, by the name, you might say, well, they're treating the depressive component of pain, but that's actually not the case. We're, we're relying on the pharmacology of these agents and they're effective whether or not you're depressed. It, it doesn't matter. So for instance, let's say you have diabetic peripheral neuropathy and you're having pain, let's say, in your feet. Well, we could use uh, something like amitriptyline, which is a tricyclic antidepressant, um, and it may relieve your pain and has nothing to do with mood. Now, a nice thing is if you happen to have depressed mood, maybe this would help you, although uh, we use these drugs in lower doses for neuropathic pain than we do for depression. For treating depression, we typically push the doses fairly high, whereas for pain, uh, for instance, with uh, amitriptyline, uh, you're probably talking about 25 or 50 milligrams at bedtime or something like that. Whereas for depression, we might be talking 100, 200, even 300 milligrams in some patients. And so they, they affect neurotransmission in the spinal cord and reduce the transmission of those things, up those signals up to the brain. And it appears that the ones that block um, uh, reuptake uh, of uh, norepinephrine work better than those that affect the reuptake of just serotonin alone. Although Cymbalta or duloxetine um, is a drug that um, affects both serotonin and norepinephrine. So again, the most common examples are the tricyclic amitriptyline, in my experience anyways, is uh, in my setting, we use more amitriptyline than the others like nortriptyline. And then you may see other drugs like a venlafaxine or duloxetine used in some patients. They work for a lot of different uh, neurologic um, pain syndromes. We've mentioned the neuralgias, the neuropathies, but they also, um, and some of these um, drugs can reduce migraines, uh, can be used to prevent them actually. So there are a number of things that we can use these for that are um, have to do with some nerve pain. Other benefits might be that they can promote sleep. So for instance, if you were to take gabapentin uh, or amitriptyline, both of those can be sedating drugs. So they can actually help you to sleep. If you take obviously an antidepressant, it might help the depression. Although, as I said, usually when we're treating pain, the dose is lower and um, it may or may not be effective um, for the depression. So if you had depression and pain, neuropathic pain, and we use one of these, we would probably crank it up to a full um, antidepressant dose. They might also relieve anxiety, panic, attack, panic attacks, although again, these, this can be a dose-related uh, thing. They can also be used with other pain-relieving modalities and, and add to the effect. So they have a, generally a good long-term safety pro profile. Uh, there are some things we have to consider. So for instance, if I had a patient who had um, Alzheimer's dementia, I probably am not going to use amitriptyline because that can cause uh, cognitive deterioration in a patient who has dementia. So, you know, within reason, you have to, to uh, look at each individual patient, what are the other medical or psychiatric issues that they have going on and make sure you're not going to uh, adversely affect one of those. But as I said, there are some things you have to watch for. Um, they, they are predictably um, sedating and cause drowsiness. Got to be careful when you drive using these. The antidepressants uh, cause constipation. Um, they have an anticholinergic effect and that slows down the gut, can lead to constipation. So they might need to increase the fiber and fluid in their diets, or they might need a, a mild um, you know, bulk forming agent, a laxative agent. They can cause dry mouth, urinary retention. Urinary retention would be an issue, especially in older men who might have um, large prostates. Got to be careful about that. They can cause weight gain. And at higher doses, blurry vision. I don't see a lot of that at lower doses, but higher doses, you could actually see that. And for some patients, these can be problematic side effects. Some other concerns, tricyclic antidepressants can be fatal in overdose. So, if the patient were depressed and suicidal, um, I'm probably not going to recommend one of the tricyclic antidepressants at this time. We have other agents that are safer and probably as effective. Um, 
some of these drugs that, that uh, are serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, you have to, when you're stopping them, you have to taper them off or people can have these weird sort of experiences where they feel like electric shocks or they, they feel ag agitated or anxious. So you have to taper these things off. Some of the drugs like the tricyclics can lower seizure thresholds. So you have to be very careful on a person who has a seizure disorder or epilepsy. And then finally, a, a, an issue that's called serotonin syndrome. And that's where you have um, too much serotonin in the system. So for instance, if you use a serotonin reuptake blocking antidepressant, and you give some other agent that affects serotonin, you can cause this syndrome where they um, become kind of delirious and the blood pressure fluctuates and, and such things. And that's called serotonin syndrome, which by the way, I've never seen. Now the anticonvulsants, as I said, the most common are carbamazepine and then its cousin oxcarbazepine um, have been used. Um, and mostly I see more carbamazepine than I do oxcarbazepine. Um, some things to think about with that drug is particularly when the dose gets pushed, and they can make people sleepy, they can cause unsteady gait. Um, in older patients, you have to worry about their sodium level, their serum sodium level can drop um, uh, with, with this drug. But when it's used and it's monitored appropriately, it's usually a pretty safe drug. And you have what, what I listed here is gabapentinoid anticonvulsants like gabapentin and pregabalin. I would say way far and away gabapentin is way more used than pregabalin, usually well tolerated. At first, you can see a, um, a, a significant amount of drowsiness with gabapentin, and they may tolerate that better um, with time. But for the most part, um, in the doses that we use gabapentin, it's, it's really fairly safe and reasonably well tolerated. Now, as I said, there are a number of topical medications that you can, can see used. Uh, most all these are um, non-prescription or over-the-counter items. They usually in, include these things like menthol or salicylates that, I, like I said, cause a mild, mild stimulation or irritation. We call them counter irritants. Um, in other words, you'll sense that as some redness um, where you apply it, some heat. Um, taking advantage of that gate theory at the level of the spinal cord and reducing the number of pain signals that reach the brain. Lidocaine is a topical anesthetic, and that's available in patch, patch forms. Um, I don't know if it's available creams or not over the counter, but we use it in, in patch form in my hospital for many patients. You just stick it over the place that hurts. And then the NSAIDs like diclofenac are available now in um, gels and uh, topical formulations that you can put on the skin and can be very helpful. These are available on a variety of things, creams, gels, et cetera. And uh, some are available as transdermal um, patches. So um, for many people, these can be used in addition to, for instance, oral therapy and can help provide some local relief of the pain, mostly for musculoskeletal uh, pain, possibly for arthritic conditions where you have you know, joint pain and swollen joints. And then there are some invasive things we can do for, for pain. Uh, so for instance, steroid injections into joints or into the spinal column. Um, I've had a, a injection of steroid into my shoulder for um, bursitis and it uh, provided some relief. Um, the problem is that the steroid will eventually wear off and you may need to have that injection again. So if it's a time limited thing, like you had an injury or something, um, they can use that and it can provide relief for sustained relief for a period of time. But if you have something that's like gonna stay um, broken or something, you know, you may not wanna do a whole bunch of steroid injection. Visco supplementation is, is where we put stuff into joints that lubricates things and it begins to provide some cushioning effect, particularly when the cartilage is worn out. There are spinal cord uh, issues that you can do, spinal cord stimulation. Uh, for some kinds of, of pain, there's uh, intrathecal, which is an injection into the uh, cerebrospinal fluid, cause uh, drug delivery into those um, areas. Obviously, it's a little bit more invasive. And then you've probably heard of epidural injections, and that's when you are going into the, for instance, the spinal column, and you go, uh, the column is a tube and the, the spinal cord is inside the bone area and it's covered by a thing called the dura, and you go through that 
uh, and inject um, an analgesics in there. Epidurals are commonly used, for instance, during birth, um, and they're very effective analgesics. And then nerve blocks where they go in and actually shoot stuff in that blocks transmissions to the ner nerves. So there are a number of, of other interventions that um, physicians can do. So let's end and talk a little bit about uh, specific things related to the developmentally disabled. Well, a myth. People with developmental disabilities may have pain, but they're not bothered by it. That is obviously not true. They may not be able to communicate it, um, and you may not even be able to tell it unless you look at their behaviors like we talked about. Um, but they are sensitive to pain, if not more, than anybody else. You know, there are some rare disorders where there can be some interruption in the ability to sense pain, but those are rare. They still experience pain. And it's often under-recognized um, and, and can be often under-treated. So for instance, the ability to communicate or even recognize that they have pain and then be able to communicate it can be impaired. It, it's hard to get an estimate of what the pain severity is. And it's often underestimated because of that. And some of the symptoms may be confused with other underlying conditions. So again, it's all about uh, knowing your consumer, being able to watch their behaviors, being able to learn how to communicate with them on their level. And um, we have to make sure that we don't um, you know, have some of these false beliefs about whether or not they feel pain and those kinds of things, because they deserve our full attention on this. And again, they have a lot of reasons. Um, I've already mentioned all of these in our patients, but these are things I see when I review the med profiles on our consumers. They have a lot of conditions that lead to chronic pain. So here's an important thing. People with uh, developmental disabilities, particularly intellectually um, developed, developmental issues, um, they, because they may have trouble expressing themselves and communicating their pain, that can lead to frustration and acting out in outbursts. So I often get um, consults about consumers who are, who are not controlled on their medications and now they're, they're having these outbursts and whatever. Um, one of the things you want to look at is if they have a chronic pain syndrome and the pain's not controlled and they have trouble expressing it, that can cause frustration. It can cause them to act out because they don't know any other behavior to do um, to respond to the pain that they're experiencing. So when you do see these kinds of things, you know, the consumer's been doing fine. Now all of a sudden there are these, there's this frustration, there's this anger, um, an ability to engage with others and such think about the underlying pain syndromes they might have and um, try and get an assessment of whether or not it's being um, controlled. And in those settings, it's more appropriate to um, intervene at the level of the pain than it is to give them a psychotropic drug to try and control their behaviors. So all I'm saying here is that when a patient, when a consumer changes, his behavior really changes, um, think about, does he have some underlying pain going on that might explain this? Some tips. Uh, know your, your consumers. Know when they're not acting like they normally do. And then ask yourself, is there some reason, is there something going on here that would be causing some, some pain? Uh, watch for events that could lead to pain. Did they bump themselves? Did they fall? Have they been sitting in their wheelchair all day long without uh, moving? those kinds of things. Understand how to communicate with them. Watch for nonverbal signs like we talked about, the frowns and the moans and those kinds of things. And then when there's a new behavior, then assess it to see that if pain could possibly be um, involved with it. And then obviously to ask for an assessment by a healthcare provider. So that's our talk on pain today. If you um, would like to get continuing education credit for this, you can contact Vicki Fisher at VMRC. She has the quiz. She will send it to you and you can answer and provide those answers to her, whether you um, just send it back in an email or you answer, print it, answer and scan and send that back to her. If you'll get it to her, then she will get you a certificate. 
And so that is our talk for today. If you have any questions on this stuff, please just email me at pharmacist at vmrc.net and we will go from there. So thank you very much.